In this class, we're talking about happiness, elusive happiness, perhaps. Where do you find it? Should you be seeking it? Is it our natural state? Let's find out. Gentle Restorative. My name is Sandra. Um, this theme is about happiness. So I want you seated in a way that makes you happy. It makes your body happy. It doesn't have to look like how I'm seated. Grab any props you want. And once you find that place, close your eyes. Deep inhale through the nose. Loud exhale. And then let's take the arms all the way up. And release the hands to the heart in prayer pose. Anjali Mudra. Stopping here to set a very happy intention. When you're ready, go ahead and release the hands. All right, keep the eyes closed. Let's deepen the breath. And while you're doing that, I want you to picture something in your mind's eye that makes you happy. And then we'll flip the hands over if they're not already. We're gonna find our seated cat cow here. So remember you're inhaling as you lengthen, you're exhaling as you round out. And then if we were live together, I would ask for some volunteers to share their answers to what makes them happy. But I do know one thing about your answers, that every answer you guys all came up with is somehow meaningful to you, right? Otherwise, I'm highly doubting that you'd say it makes you happy. Even if it's having a churro for breakfast, for in some capacity that's meaningful to you, it's something you really like, right? Or if it's an object lying around the house, there's a reason that you chose it as the object that makes you happy. Or you might have chosen a person, you might have chosen a place, but all these things tie in to, in some way, being meaningful to you. All right, sitting back up. Inhale the arms and exhale to the heart. So most of you are going to be watching this on YouTube pre-recorded, but at the moment, I'm live and asked my live students what are their favorite yoga poses? What are the poses that make them happy? We've got a couple hip openers in there. Actually, we have three out of, yeah, there's three hip openers, so we need to open up the hips. We're gonna flip on over into table before we get to those poses so we can warm up. We'll do a little bit of thinking while we're moving. So from table, I want you to shift the weight into the right leg, and we're just gonna go ahead and make circles with that left knee. I'm bringing the knee forward and then taking it back. So this topic of happiness was something that I was conversing about all day. And then on the radio, they were talking about um, how the countries rank as far as which countries have the happiest people. So 
kind of a coincidence, but I don't believe in coincidences. So that all directed me to, well, this has to be the theme of our class today. Okay, switch the direction of that leg. So one of the questions I would have you consider is, well, come up with a definition in your head of what you think happiness is. I'll give you a second to do that. Doesn't have to be a complete sentence. It might just be keywords. Go ahead, set that leg down. Inhale, cow. Exhale, cat. Come back to a neutral spine. Shift the weight into the left leg. Start making those circles with the right. So what we are gonna talk about are some of the myths or fallacies that surround the topic of happiness. And one of those is that happiness is our natural state of being, okay? Go ahead, switch directions with that right leg. So the word state, I kind of want to focus on that because that already directs us to happiness is not one of our character traits. I mean, you can say somebody's always happy, but are they really always labeled happy, right? It's not a character trait. It's not like um, this person is very kind or they're um, polite or they're, uh, I don't know, what are some other characters? They're very smart. Maybe those are character traits, right? Happiness is a state of being, which means it's ever changing. Go ahead, set that leg back down. Inhale, cow. Why is it ever changing? Exhale, cat. Come back to a neutral spine. I want you to, I'm gonna take my right leg and shift it over closer to the left so it's more centered underneath me. That way I can take the left leg back and then set the inner edge of that foot down. And you keep your left hand down if you want to. You could take that hand to your heart, to your hip, or send it all the way up, it's completely up to you. Out of curiosity, what would make you happy? So happiness is a state of being because it's ever changing. If it wasn't ever changing, if it was a constant, we would never experience other emotions like Sadness, anger, fear, frustration, dot, 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 right? So happiness cannot be our natural state. Our natural state is ever-changing. It's fluid. Go ahead, bring this arm back down, set the knee down. So now you might be thinking, but wait, oh, there's so many yogis who walk around saying our, our, our true self is bliss. So that's different. In my opinion, in my interpretation, that's different. I'm gonna explain that in a second, but first, go ahead and send that right leg back, come on to the inner edge of that back foot, and then again, do whatever makes you happy with that right arm. And then go ahead and bring that arm back down, replant the legs. And then here we're gonna tuck the toes and here's happy pose number one, downward facing dog. You might wanna walk this out at first when you get there to loosen up. Deepen the breath. And then let's go ahead and walk the feet halfway forward. Nothing fancy here. I'm gonna look around and see where my blocks are. If you don't have blocks, um, bolster, pillow, probably both, um, we're gonna come into supportive malasana because that's an easy way to open up the hips. So I'm gonna take my feet to the width of the mat, uh, toes are wider than the heels. 
Come on, down into a squat. As you're coming down, get those props behind you so you can sit right down on top of them. Super easy to support yourself in this way, right? Then we don't have to worry about balance. You've got the hips open. You can still lengthen, get the elbows tucked inside the knees, hands at the heart, and close your eyes. Sending the breath to the hips. Okay, so while you're there, this is why I think saying that our true self, our, our inner true nature is bliss. Why that's different from saying our true nature should be happiness. So I already said happiness is a state of being, right? To me, happiness is, <clears throat> it's talking about the human self, right? Because that true inner spirit, to me, that's your soul that you're taking with you through many lifetimes and whatever's in between. The spirit inside is not going through fear, anger, emotion. Uh, <laughs> those are emotions. Fear, anger, sadness, frustration, angst, uh, depression. Those are human states. And so I believe, yes, our true inner spirit, our inner voice, that Atman inside, that true nature is bliss. When we are here on earth in human form, that light gets covered up kind of like, uh, you know, it's like the center of maybe an onion and all the layers are growing over and around it. And those are all of our life lessons we have to work through. And maybe one of those is anger and one of those is sadness, but we can't be human and not experience sadness right? And if you don't experience sadness, you have no idea what happiness is. I wouldn't even know how you begin to go about defining it, right? Don't know darkness without light. You've heard this before, right? And so that makes a difference. So happiness, not our, tr our, our natural state of being. Our natural state of being is ever-changing. All right, deep breath in. Let it go. All right, I'm sure this is gonna be graceful, but let's come on off of those props. However that works for you. And let's grab, um, yeah, I think we're gonna need it all. Not the um, strap though. So grab all your props, look around if you don't have yoga props, anything can be a yoga prop, right? Okay, so holster, vertical, out behind me. This is happy pose number two. Um, I'm going to take my blanket. I just kind of scrunched it up in a ball and I'm going to put it underneath the far end of my bolster. Why not the block? Well, I kind of prefer to have a block to go under each knee. Um, so if you have more than two blocks around you, you could toss a block underneath the bolster. All right, Sukta Baddha Konasana. So let's get ourselves situated so we can feel the bolster behind us, soles of the feet together. And then knees go wide, prop up your legs, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and gently lay back. <sighs> so, a very gentle, peaceful hip opening pose. Um, this is a good one to work our way up to <clears throat> where we're headed. Don't let that scare you. Um, if we're talking about happiness as our yoga theme, I'm going to insist that you're happy in the poses. So, you know, if we get to a pose you don't like or your body doesn't like, more importantly, skip it, change it up, do something different. All right, so the other issue with the topic of happiness is that our definition of happiness and this idea that we're supposed to always be happy has come from somewhere. And so as I think about, well, where does that idea come from? I think about social media. I think about advertisements. I think social media is probably the worst, right? Because everybody poses happily. Um, we don't generally see a lot of people posting their distraught self. Um, we don't see them 
yelling at somebody. So we begin to create this notion, this perception that everybody must be happy except for me. Now, do you know somebody who's always happy? Because I don't. And it certainly isn't me, so you cross me off your list, right? It's not possible because we already said our, our human state is ever changing. In fact, you could be blissfully happy right now. And while I'm talking, um, maybe somebody barges into the room where you're trying to do restorative yoga and instantly you're upset, right? Ever changing. So another fallacy about happiness is that if we are unhappy, then something is terribly wrong with us, right? If it is not our natural state to always be happy, then, this is like an if-then statement, then it makes sense that it is our natural state to not always be happy. I hope I said that right, because I paused in the middle and then I got lost. So if it's not our natural state to always be happy, then it's okay and normal to be unhappy. That's how I meant to say it. So what about this, this notion also um, that we should be able to control those unhappy thoughts and push them aside? We are talking often in yoga about pushing thoughts aside, right? A little bit different context. Um, <clears throat> and so like, what is wrong with me? I can't push these thoughts away. I can't change them. I have no control over them. So we've talked before about meditation. Meditation is not about clearing the mind and pushing all the thoughts away. If you think that's what meditation is, I am gonna be the one to break it to you that you are probably going to end that meditation quickly thinking you're not doing it right. So it's about focusing our awareness. Sometimes when we're meditating, we might actually focus on those thoughts. Sometimes we're trying to focus on something else to distract us from those thoughts, such as um, I might hold crystals in my hand that I can feel the weight of, I can feel their coolness, I can feel their vibration. I might be focused on staring at a candle flame. Perhaps I am sitting outside and I'm watching leaves move in the wind, right? I might be on a walking meditation. And so my focus is on each footstep. Right? And so this idea that we should be able to change our thoughts to happy ones is, I don't even know, I don't even know how to end that sentence. It's, it's, it's nuts. That, that is so not what we're able to do. We're bombarded by thoughts continuously, right? And remember, we've talked about how illusory control is. It's Maya in Sanskrit. Um, you only have control over your reactions and your actions. And so how are we going to react to our unhappiness? So I'm gonna stop talking for a moment. You're like, oh, thank you. Um, I want you to think about what is your go-to reaction for when you're unhappy? While you're 
still pondering that question, perhaps, go ahead and stretch out your legs. So most of what I'm telling you comes from this book called The Happiness Trap. Um, this idea that when we think everything and everyone should be happy, it's a trap. Because then we set ourselves up, and this is going to sound familiar, we set ourselves up for suffering. And where does that come from? Yes, Patanjali and his Yoga Sutra. So we are going to be present with unhappiness. And you probably now have thought of something you usually do when you're unhappy. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a second. But first, go ahead and get your elbows into the earth. Lift the head. Pull the chin down. Hold it right here. And then oftentimes, I think it's best to know where we're headed. Look straight at your feet. And then we're going to reach for them and just pull the core in and imagine that there's a string attached to the feet that's going to pull us up. So let's see if we can make our way up. Guess what? If we can't, who cares? Then plant your hands and push your way up, right? Whatever works for you. That's the whole point. Yeah? All right. So let's go ahead and draw that right knee in. Give it a good hug. Pull it close. Flex that left foot. Sit up tall. Close your eyes. Okay, so from here, I'm going to bring my right arm inside of that right knee. And you can go ahead and move that foot over a couple inches so that arm doesn't feel like it's being squashed. Yeah. All right, sit up here. Slowly hinging forward, hands are walking forward. We're just going to come into a very peaceful fold. Doesn't have to go far. You might want to inhale, lift up, exhale, settle in. And then just go ahead and find that place where the fold is good for you. It's meeting your edge. It's not painful, but it's a good stretch. And let's hang out right there. And then let's come all the way back up. Ah, switch legs. Okay. So I asked you to think about your reaction to being unhappy. Is the reaction you thought of a healthy choice? So in other words, what I thought of was when I am unhappy, I tend to withdraw. Okay, so that's not a great choice. I would not put that in a healthy category, right? Then I thought, oh, I should have thought of something better like eating a carton of Baskin and Robbins ice cream, which sounds really good right now. That's definitely not a healthy option either. Um, so, you know, what do you tend to do? Now, I'm not saying all of your answers are unhealthy. Maybe you thought of, well, I sit down and I call my support, my best friend, I call my mom, I call my sister. That's a healthy choice, as long as that's a person that supports you, right? Okay, left arm inside the knee. Scooch that foot over a little bit if you need to. Plant those fingers, sit up tall. Front foot is flexed, that protects the knee, of course. And then hinge forward, ah, slowly. And then create some movement with the breath. And then when you're ready, settle into that fold. Mm -hmm. 
And then go ahead and come on back up. Ah, hug the knees in. So, kind of left off with our reaction and maybe we need to change our reaction. This is gonna lead into, really it's a whole other theme, right? It leads us all into talking about attachment, how attachment leads to suffering, which is so Yoga Sutra. Um, move those props aside while I'm talking your ear off. Sorry, I know this is a restorative class, but I feel quite chatty, so bear with me. Look back on over in the table. All right, so I'm going to say this. This was one of the happy poses suggested. Um, if it's not your happy pose, you don't have to do it. You can do something different. We are going to widen out the knees. And yes, I know the pose was changed to something more accommodating, but I want everyone to be happy. So knees go wide, feet flail outward. Now, if you want to, I probably should have told you this before you got in this position, you could grab a bunch of props and get them underneath your thighs to hold you in place, but um, you don't have to. So what we're looking for is the hips edge. How far can the hips widen out before they can't go any farther? So if you're at that place, then right here is frog. If you can widen out the legs, you might want to come on down to the forearms. Um, that's fine. One thing I want you to watch out for in frog um, that I have noticed in a lot of classes is the tendency in order to get lower is to let the hips come forward. We want the hips to stay where they were in relationship to the knees, okay? So if you get here and you're uncomfortable, I'm okay with that. We need to learn to be uncomfortable. If you get here and you're in pain, I would highly suggest pulling the feet in towards each other and taking this more to a child's pose. So you decide what's right for you. Deep in the breath. this might be a good time to think about your reaction to being unhappy. <laughs> I was thinking about, well, if I was on my mat and it was just me and you guys weren't there with me, my reaction would probably be, well, I probably wouldn't have came into this pose in the first place. I probably wouldn't still be in it. So you can look at that as, a fleeing reaction, an avoidance reaction, those aren't good either, right? Give me a deep breath in, let it out. All right, pull one foot in behind you, then the other. Makes it much easier to push the hips back and then use your hands to get you back up and then you can bring those legs back in. All right, we need a restorative pose, don't we? Let's grab the blanket. I know mine is just the, I'd say folded mess, but it's not even really folded. I'm gonna put that across my mat, right in the middle, and then come on down, hips on top of that blanket. Ah, perfect, we're finding gecko on the left side. So hip opener for the left hip, settle in. When you're ready, close your eyes. Okay, so this is what I want you to picture. You're like, oh gosh, finally she's gonna be quiet. <laughs> no, I'm not. What I want you to visualize on this side of gecko is I'm gonna guess maybe somebody out there said flowers make them happy or receiving flowers. So I want you to picture a bouquet of flowers in a beautiful vase. I want you to pay attention to the detailing on the vase. What color is it? Is it multiple colors? Texture, design, etching, um, symbolism, meaning, who gave it to you? Where'd you get it? Um, you really like this vase. So I'm gonna give you a moment to really get a good look at that. Okay, 
So see that vase sitting on your counter, beautiful flowers. This is your favorite vase, you love it. Now, right next to it on the counter, is another bouquet of flowers in a vase that you do not like. In fact, this would be your top choice to put in the garage sale pile, but perhaps you didn't have another one at the moment, so you're using it as well. Each bouquet equally beautiful. Vase, not so much. Go ahead and picture that. Okay. So let's imagine your dog comes bounding into the room. If you don't have a dog, pretend you do for the moment. Bounding into the room, knocks into you. You hit both vases. They both crash to the ground, one on either side of you. You glance down at the vase that you did not like. What is your feeling? What's your reaction? So most likely you were thinking, oh, I really I could care less. I'm definitely not going to try to fix that or um, perfect. Now it's going in the garbage. Save me a trip to Goodwill. Didn't care about it in the first place. Now you slowly turn to see the condition of your favorite base. So go ahead and turn to the other side and take that in. So your reaction to the other vase is probably very different. You're probably looking at it first thinking, is there any way to salvage this? Then you might be sad. Oh my gosh, that was my favorite vase. Uh, So-and-so gave it to me or I bought it on this vacation. And you cannot believe that you're gonna have to bend down and pick up these pieces and throw them in the garbage. So what the heck was the point of all that? We're getting to it, but first I want you to straighten out your left leg, turn gecko to the other side. So remember that right leg's gonna come out beside you, 90 degrees at the hip and at the knee, right arm comes out in scarecrow, 90 degrees at the elbow. Okay, what I want you to picture now is put both vases intact, like you hit rewind, get them back on the counter, just the way they were before they fell. Now, I want you to detach from both vases. So you might say, well, I'm already detached from the ugly one, I don't like it. No, you actually have a negative attachment to it, right? I want you to detach from both. So it is a neutral, I, I won't even say attachment, it's, it's a neutral perception. Oh, okay, what does that mean? It means I recognize that both of the vases are simply replaceable vessels that are holding my flowers. And they are not really attached to where I got them or who gave them to me. That's in my head, that's a, that's a memory right? There isn't a tangible attachment to these. So I want you to look at them both equally, neutrally, so you don't care what happens to them. There's no attachment to their fate, if you will. So now, dog comes running in, bumps into you, you bump into the vases. One falls on one side, the other falls on the other. See yourself looking at the first vase on the floor, shattered. Turn and look at the other one, shattered. 
I mean, you can still go, well, the other one was prettier, but without attachment. So now I sweep them both up, put the pieces in the garbage. I am not sad because I didn't attach to them. See, I'm not suffering. Sadness, suffering. So it is our attachment to these things that we think make us happy that creates the sadness and the suffering. So there has to be both, has to be ever changing. So let's go back to the very first question I asked you. Picture something that makes you happy. What if you said a person? What does that mean? I'm not supposed to attach to that person. I'm supposed to detach. No, actually, I'm not insinuating that. It's simply factual, though, when I say that because you're attached to that person, which is human, we want to love and be loved, that you will experience suffering or sadness when that person is no longer around you, with you, the relationship ends, you've parted ways. See, that's human. That's, that's part of our ever-changing nature, and that's okay. Now, if you pictured an object, I would again suggest that you practice looking at that object and detaching from it. What if it wasn't in my house? What if I didn't own it anymore? What if it got stolen, right? We have so much stuff. Does it have to be replaced? Does that make sense? I'm just picturing everybody nodding and, okay, be quiet. Let's go ahead and straighten the legs out of get-go. Ah, plant the palms underneath the shoulders, point through the feet, slowly lift on up into your cobra, wherever that ends up and makes you happy. Deepen the breath. The arms have a soft bend to them. Shoulders are back and down. Heart is moving forward as the ears pull back. Perfect. And then let's pull the hips all the way back into child's pose, Velasana. You can leave that blanket there if you want. While you're here in child's pose, let's let the hands walk towards each other and then find prayer pose with the hands. And then interlace all the fingers except the index fingers. So the hands are in Agni Mudra. As you release the hands, I can start to pull the elbows in, walk our way back up. All right, so we're setting up for pigeon, which is a hip opener. And I'm thinking that props in this pose would make me very happy. Um, you don't have to use them if you don't want to. There are a multitude of ways that we could set up props in this pose. So I'll suggest a couple and you pick what 
What makes you happy? That's right. I heard somebody yell that. Okay. So bolster out in front of you. I'm going to take this blanket, which again, isn't folded very well, but um, kind of a, a narrow rectangle. I'm going to put this on my left side so that the top of my left leg will be resting right here. Often it's hard to keep the hips balanced in pigeon. That's the most common issue with this pose that I've seen. So you might want a block to tuck underneath the right hip. If you don't have a block, um, gosh, you know, like a wadded up t-shirt or something would do or another pillow. All right, so I wanna get my left knee up on top of this blanket. We've talked about setting the alignment for pigeon a lot. So if pigeon's not new to you, Go ahead, dive on in. If it's totally new pose, we need to bring that right knee up behind the right wrist and get the right foot to move across. So for some of us, we can get that right foot to come way across where the shin is parallel to the front of the mat. For others, we might want that foot drawn all the way back underneath the left hip. And then, you know, some of us will be somewhere in between. This is totally up to you. That back leg then is the one that's going to move. I'm gonna tuck my toes, pick up that leg, scooch backwards so that I feel like I'm perched up on the hips. Now with the blanket here, I do feel like I'm tipping right. So I wanna take a block, get it under my right hip. And then you get to decide here if you wanna stay perched on your hands or come down into a fold, which is why I put the bolster here. So I could just come down and use it as a pillow. So make yourself comfy. If your body cannot do pigeon, then let me really gracefully flip on over and show you how to do it on your back. If you want to come onto your back, the outer right ankle will be on the left thigh and then left foot takes flight from the earth as your hands interlock behind. Um, you want to be careful to keep the right foot flexed and the knee pushing away from you. So this is equally fine. Okay, so I wanna talk about control. Um, in that scenario I gave you, we did not have control over the dog that bounded into the room, bumped into us, and then faces crashing to the ground. We, we didn't have any control over that. But in those two scenarios, we had control over our feelings and our attachment the vases. So we had control over our reaction. This is where I'm heading. Now that Sanskrit word Maya, I love that word. I don't know. It just kind of has a flow coming out of the mouth. Maya. Illusion, right? Non-coincidentally, Maya is also the name of the demon who taunts Buddha when he is trying to reach enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. And so this demon sends all of these, these thoughts into Buddha's mind, trying to distract him. Does this sound at all familiar? Ever have thoughts bombard you that seem to want to distract you, right? And so control over the thoughts is maya. It's an illusion. We can't control them, but we can refocus. So... Let's think how we can um, tie this into pigeon pose. Let's say I suggested pigeon pose, which I did, and you are either happily in it or you're unhappily in it. You don't have control over me suggesting that pose, but you have control over your actions. So if you didn't want to do it, you certainly didn't have to go there. I can't see what you're doing, right? Or let's say you did go to pigeon to give it another shot like I did with frog, right? And so we can work on changing our reaction to it. Well, why don't we like pigeon pose? Do you not like the hip being open? Is that too far for the hip to be open for you? Um, do you feel like you always want to tip over? Is it painful? Um, does the front knee um, not enjoy that position? And so once we 
to figure out what we don't like about it, then we can change our reaction. So if it's pain that's in the body, that's an action that needs to be changed. If it's simply, I don't know, I, my body's fine, I just don't like the pose or I'm bored, like when are we moving on? Well, that, my friends, is a reaction that we do have control over. So wow, this topic could go on and on, right? Ultimately, ultimately, I just want you to be happy on the mat. So take your focus to your breath. Where does it feel like the breath starts for you? Where does it end? I'm sure we all had different answers to that question, but now I want you to look at the breath as a never ending circle or never ending cycle. So there is no beginning and end. See it as a constant flow of inhale, perhaps natural pause, exhale, natural pause, inhale, natural pause. You get the picture. So let's go ahead, find our way gently out of pigeon pose. Um, and I'm gonna to toss in an option here. If you want to, remember down dog was one of the happy poses mentioned. If your hips would enjoy that, which I'm thinking they really probably would, but you can head to dog from here by tucking the back toes, lifting that leg, and then getting this front leg over whatever prop you're using and meander on back to Adho Mukha Svanasana. If you're in pigeon and you're feeling pretty stuck and there is just no way in heck that the body is going from here to dog, that's okay. Why don't you slide the block out from under your right hip, tip on over, free your legs, come to table, head to dog, go to child's pose, right? We will set up for pigeon on the other side in a moment. So wherever you're at, give me a deep breath in. Loud exhale. And then let's bring the knees down so we can set up our props on the other side. I don't know why I threw my blanket. Take your time getting into this pose. So I mentioned to you that I was in the car, I had talk radio on, and they were talking about how countries rank in order of happiness. So United States came in at 15. And the question posed, which I thought was, I don't know, a little odd, was only 15. How could we be happier? So, you know, out of all the countries, I thought 15 was pretty good. In fact, I was surprised. <laughs> I was surprised we were at 15. My guess in my head was more like 49. Um, number one country was Finland, if you're curious. Uh, the other ones in the top five, I believe, were Norway, Denmark, Iceland, and um, New Zealand was up there. And so that question, what do we need to do to be happier? Mm -hmm. Kind of misses the boat, doesn't it? Because if happy is not our natural state and our humans experience 
is supposed to be a multitude of emotions. Like, why is that? Well, we're here to learn something, right? You cannot learn if you are 100% happy 100% of the time. You'll never learn what not being happy is all about, what sadness is about, what grief is about, what forgiveness is about, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so I don't know. When I heard that question, I thought, no, he's asking the wrong question. It isn't or shouldn't be our goal to be the happiest country in the world. I don't really find that significant, do you? What makes these other countries rank above us? What experience are those people having that we are not, right? Do you suppose it's their landscape? Um, and I think that's a relevant question because, you know, living in Illinois, it's pretty blah. Yes, I would be happy to see some ocean and some beaches and some mountains. If I lived in those places, would that keep me happy? See, I think at some point that happiness from being around the beaches or the ocean or the mountains peaks off and it starts to come back down because why? Because I'm human and I'm gonna have other emotions that need to work their way in. So I think my bottom line of this theme is, next time the thought pops into your head, what can I do to make myself happier? How about just tapping into what you're experiencing in that moment? Notice what you're feeling. What's the takeaway from it? And yeah, happiness will come when it's ready ever-changing. All right. I promise I will not talk through Shavasana. I am so done talking your ear off. I think I've said everything I meant to say. So give me a deep inhale. Loud exhale. However, it is best for you to make your way out of pigeon pose. Just take your time. In fact, while you're transitioning, you could toss props wherever you want them for Shavasana, because that's where we're headed. It is essentially important to me that you make yourself happy in Shavasana. So make sure you get the props right, right for you. Like it's freezing down here. So <laughs> if this blanket could just cover every inch of me, I'll be good. I'll be happy. <sighs> and then I want you to do a body scan. I want you to make sure the body is content. Because sometimes I think we settle in, and, you know, you may have thought, oh, finally, we're done with pigeon. But that means we're thinking about something in the past. So in your present moment, is the body completely content? And if it's not, Wiggle around. I can feel this blanket underneath my shoulder blade. It feels weird. I'm going to scooch it aside. Ah, and when you are completely content, I want you to take a huge inhale with a loud sigh. Ah, okay, I'm zipping my lips. I'll see you on the other side of Shavasana.
Bring your focus back to your breath. Allowing that breath to deepen. And as you do so, perhaps you might add a soft smile to your face since we are talking about happiness on the mat. Hopefully you're feeling relaxed and restored. Invite some movement into the body if you so choose. And then go ahead and roll to a side in a fetal position. Mm-hmm. And as you slowly make your way back up to a seated pose, Will you keep in mind that it's okay to feel however you're feeling? You don't have to feel happy right now. You don't have to feel restored. You don't have to feel rested, rejuvenated. You get to feel however you're feeling. And in that, you're being present. Give me a deep inhale. Loud exhale. Inhale the arms all the way up. When the palms find each other, exhale them back home to your heart in Anjali Mudra. The light in me bows to the light in you. When I'm in that place in me and you're in that place in you, then we become one. Namaste. Namaste.